Hello, dear listeners. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I'm your trusty host and myth lunatic, Liv. Well, we're back once again with that man. Oh, that man. Aeneas. But before we do, I would be crazy not to, once more, remind you all that I wrote a fucking book. Holy shit, for real. Um, This week is absolutely nuts because I'm working on edits for it while also still doing my full-time retail job during a pandemic and also getting an episode out to you beautiful people. It's kind of a mess, really. I'm kind of a mess, but such is life. So I've written this book. It's about Greek mythology. Weird, I know. Greek Mythology, the Gods, Goddesses, and Heroes Handbook is a fun and casual look at the major players from Greek mythology. They each have their own entries where you can learn about all the gods and goddesses that I've told you all about in the past, but in a new and beautiful way. It has, honestly, the most beautiful illustrations I've ever seen. I mean, the cover is unreal. You can see that for yourselves. But when I tell you that the illustrations inside are going to blow your minds, that is an absolute understatement. Sarah Richards is the illustrator, and what she's done makes me want to straight up scream cry with happiness. So do me a favor and pre-order the book now. Would you head to my website, mythbaby.com slash book for links based on your region. From there, you can pre-order directly from Simon & Schuster, or you can look on their list for your local bookstores. Um, if you don't see your region listed, that's fine. It'll still be available. Um, just search your local bookstores because most have it. The same goes if you only see ebook. You'll be able to get the print edition in your region. It's just sometimes they're weird in showing up. You just have to look a little bit harder. And given the illustrations, I think you want to print one. And Canadians, if you pre-order from Monroe's Books here in Victoria, I will be signing and personalizing copies when they come out. How fucking cool is that? So search my name, Liv Albert, at monroebooks.com. That's M-U-N-R-O-B-O-O-K-S dot com. Exciting stuff happening. Also, God, I want to sleep for days and days. But where did we leave Aeneas and his Aeneid? Right, we're talking Dido. Dido is a Phoenician woman, a Phoenician queen. Phoenicia, meanwhile, was one of the most ancient civilizations in the Mediterranean. The ancient Greeks credited the Phoenicians with giving them an alphabet, attributing it to the hero Cadmus, who was also from Tyr. Phoenicia was epic, important, and eventually spawned colonies all around the Mediterranean, including the one ruled by Dido, Carthage, one of Rome's most impressive enemies. In the West, we don't talk about Phoenicia as much as we should because everyone's so obsessed with ancient Greece and ancient Rome, myself included, I'll admit that, but that's made possible by the education I was given. Tyr is in modern Lebanon, about 80 kilometers from Beirut, so with today's episode, I have an ask of you. If you're able, please donate to the people of Lebanon and of Beirut. The explosion in Beirut is one of the most horrific things I personally have ever seen, captured on countless innocent people's phones as they believed they were looking at a random fire. I don't have much to say other than that, because there are just no words. But the people in Lebanon, specifically Beirut, desperately need help. If you haven't heard what happened or want to understand why they need help, just look for one of the videos of the explosion. No one saw it coming. I don't want to sound like an expert on what happened or why, but from what I've learned, you want to help the people of Lebanon, not government agencies of Lebanon. I've given to the Red Cross, but you can do your research and see who needs it. I've heard the Red Cross is doing really good work. If you have anything, consider donating it to the people of Lebanon. Dido's people, Cadmus's people. So where did we leave Aeneas? Well, he's finally finished telling his story about how he and his men arrived there, in Carthage, seated at Dido's table in her great kingdom. Meanwhile, Dido has been placed under a very, very, very powerful love spell by Aeneas's mother and half-brother, Venus and Cupid. Dido is overtaken... She's completely under the control of that spell. This is episode 89. Dido wonders why she got out of bed at all. Dido speaks with her sister, Anna, about her new and powerful feelings for this Trojan, Aeneas. 
She's overwhelmed by all she feels. The emotions are all encompassing and suddenly he is all she can think about. But still, even with the power of the love spell, Dido knows her history. She feels bad that she loves Aeneas when her own husband died. She didn't think she would or should ever marry again, that it would be an insult to him. But Anna feels differently. You can't mourn forever, Dido, she tells her sister. Anna's really supportive, actually. I mean, it's also fucking tragic, but they don't know that yet. Anna tells her sister that she shouldn't beat herself up, she's allowed to love again, and she should let herself love again. Sicaeus, Dido's late husband, would understand and would want her to be happy. Anna's a good sister. Anyway, this is all going to get very depressing. Anna continues on, reassuring Dido that if she were ever going to let herself love again, to let herself marry again, Aeneas has to be the most suitable man there is. There must be a reason that the Trojans landed on the shores of Carthage, Anna tells Dido. It must be the will of Hera that they arrive there. It certainly must mean that the empire he is destined to build will include Carthage, that it will be their marriage that allows the foundations of this momentous, all-powerful empire. Anna continues, getting a little heavy with the foreshadowing now. You can make this work, Anna tells Dido. Work to get the gods on your side, she suggests. Make the necessary offerings and make it work for yourself. Tell Aeneas that he mustn't leave just yet, that the rainy season spells doom for his ships if he does, that he must delay. Delay him long enough to secure marriage. Let's revisit Dido a little bit, shall we? Dido is a fucking queen. I mean, okay, she's literally a queen, but also she's a queen in that badass figurative way. Dido is from Tyre, Phoenicia, modern Lebanon, please give to the people of Beirut. When her brother was a fucking asshole, she took a group of people and fucked right off, founding her own empire in modern Tunisia. Therefore, Dido was a badass woman of Middle Eastern descent who brought a bunch of Middle Eastern people to Africa, where they teamed up with the people of Northern Africa to become fucking badasses. Dido ruled a city on her own, no man needed, for ages, and it was awesome. Dido didn't need a man at all. She was a fucking queen in her own right, kicking ass in the city. She was strong, smart, cool. I don't know. She probably was loads of other things, especially if she was able to do everything she did. I mean, who else could do all that but one incredible woman? Anyway, I just really want to make it clear how important and strong and wonderful Dido was, because, you know, tragedy. With Anna's convincing, Dido begins to have hope that she can truly love again, that she can be happy with Aeneas, that together they can rule one of the world's greatest empires. So they get to work. Together, Dido and Anna visit all the necessary temples, they perform all the necessary sacrifices and rites in order to please the gods in preparation for the hoped-for union between Dido and Aeneas. They sacrifice first to Juno, goddess of marriage. I mean, she's the obvious go-to. Then Apollo, Ceres, or Demeter, and Bacchus. Dido continues, slaughtering animals for all the gods, all in the hopes of, what, convincing Aeneas they're made for each other? Venus and Cupid have toyed with her, have planted something in her brain, have caused her to lose her ability to reason. And it only gets worse. Dido's mental state continues to deteriorate as time goes on, as the love spell inflicted upon her by Venus and Cupid continues to take hold. She sees Aeneas as much as possible, but is losing her ability to speak coherently, leaving her sentences half-finished in a kind of dreamlike state. In the evening, around the banquet table in her palace's great halls, she asks once more to hear the story of the fall of Troy, wanting to listen to Aeneas speak as long as possible. Things continue on this way, with her thinking of him and only him, picturing him when he's not before her, lingering in the seats he's just vacated, fawning over and cuddling Aeneas' son, Ascanius. It would be heartbreaking if it weren't entirely created by the gods in an effort to ruin the Carthaginians so that Juno can't use them to harm Venus's precious, precious son, Aeneas. 
definitely could have ruined them without causing a woman to lose her mind and her obsession for a man, Venus. It's pretty gross. As Dido's obsession for Aeneas progresses, the growth of her precious Carthage declines. Dido built Carthage from nothing, with just the help of whoever she brought with her when she fled Tyr. Carthage had become a great city, an incredible city with stunning architecture, a bustling market. It was becoming one of the most impressive civilizations in the Mediterranean, all on the direction of Dido, its queen. Carthage was on track to become greater even than Rome, until Dido's obsession with Aeneas caused all of that growth to fall by the wayside. Towers were no longer being built, craftsmen were no longer crafting without the direction of Dido. Construction stalled without her to spur it on, to give guidance and tell them what to do and where to expand this great city of Carthage. Mythologically, Virgil and Augustus are pouring salt in the wounds of the Carthaginians, who, a bit over a hundred years before the Aeneid was written, had been completely decimated by the Romans in the Third Punic War. The Romans and the Carthaginians have been at war on and off for a generation, and during the Third War between them, the Romans finally sacked the city of Carthage, killed nearly everyone there, and basically demolished it entirely. The Romans had already won. They'd completely taken out an entire civilization, one that had been there long before Rome and had incredible power and influence in the region. But that wasn't enough. They also had to claim that their founder had been the ruin of Carthage's founder hundreds of years before the fall of the city in history. Anyway, the Romans could be huge fucking assholes. For more, you should really listen to Ancient History Fangirl. So as Dido descended into her overwhelming love and desire for Aeneas, Carthage suffered. Juno, of course, took notice. She knew whose fault it was and went straight to Venus, chiding her for what she and her son had done to Dido and the Carthaginians. I know you've been watching, concerned and perhaps a bit jealous as Carthage grew under the rule of Dido, Juno says to Venus. You've done a great job here, planting the seed of their ruin, but where does it end? When is enough enough for you, Venus? Juno has a proposition, an attempt to quell the damage being done to Dido and Carthage via Venus and Cupid's love spell. Why don't we have a treaty, a contract, to ensure both sides get what they want, Juno proposes. A marriage contract between Dido and Aeneas, she adds. Surely that would put an end to these concerns, these jealousies. You've already caused her to fall in love with Aeneas in such a violent manner, Juno says. Isn't the natural progression to ensure their marriage? When they're married and their empires combined, together you and I can control them. Juno caps it off by saying aloud what's so wrong about marriage and the treatment of women in the ancient world. As her husband's slave, Juno tells Venus, Dido would give to you all these Phoenicians of Carthage as a dowry. As her husband's slave. Of course, Venus doesn't bat an eye at this. She lives in this world. She's of this world. Instead, she senses that Juno isn't being entirely honest about her proposal, that she's trying to consolidate power on the African continent rather than Italy, where Aeneas is meant to be heading. Venus wants her son to rule his own empire, not to inherit one from the woman he marries. So Venus tells Juno to ask her husband, Jupiter, what his intention is with Aeneas, Dido, and the Carthaginians. Does he intend to have two empires that are allied, or one whose population is blended between the Trojan refugees and the Tyrian refugees of Carthage? Fine, Juno responds. She'll ask Jupiter and will let Venus know once she does. But for now, she says, the pair, Dido and Aeneas, are planning a hunting trip for the next day, and Juno has a plan. She whispers her plan to Venus, her plans for the hunting trip the following day, and how she can use it to her advantage, putting Aeneas and Dido in a position to be together, alone, for a time, and how there the goddess can officially bind Dido to Aeneas. When she's heard Juno's plan, Venus laughs at Juno's boldness. (laughs) 
At dawn the next day, the hunting trip starts out as planned. Aeneas and Dido would be accompanied by countless other men and women, soldiers and huntsmen, all very prepared for what they're heading out to do. They bring spears and nets, horsemen accompanied by dogs. Dido, accompanied by a retinue of women by her side, mounts her horse, both decked out in purple and gold, symbolic colors of Phoenician royalty. Aeneas joins her with his Trojan soldiers to be the queen's escort out into the nearby hills and woods. Animals run from them as the group approaches. I mean, I'm no hunter, but it seems to me that bringing quite so many people out would kind of give you away. Not sure how many animals you can sneak up on with so many in tow, but then they're fancy, they're royalty, they have to do things their own way. But before anything can happen, really, before they even see animals to hunt, the sky opens up over the group, and an absolutely torrential downpour of rain and hail falls upon them. They don't see the clouds coming. There was no indication of rain. It's almost as though a goddess was at work. In shock, the group scatters in an attempt to find immediate shelter from the falling hail. Everyone runs in different directions, all just trying to save themselves from the dangerous ice falling upon them. Just as Juno had planned, Aeneas and Dido find themselves together, but apart from every other person they'd set out with that day. Aeneas finds them shelter in a nearby cave, now quite safe from the weather and completely alone together. There, spurred on by Juno, Aeneas and Dido have sex. Lightning flashes above them as they do. Nymphs howl in the mountains. That's it. The final straw of Dido's fate. Just as he has up till now, Virgil doesn't attempt to hide what this means for Dido, how her entire future is sealed in this one moment of passion. Dido's passion for Aeneas is quelled, and, quote, she called it marriage to conceal her shame. Rumor of Aeneas and Dido's sexy times in the cave spread quickly throughout Carthage, Symbolically, it's attributed to a goddess, rumor, but it would have spread with or without a goddess around to help. The news spreads and transforms. One event between these two turns into a whole affair, but whether or not they were together longer, more often than that one night in the cave, isn't clear. What matters is that Aeneas is now seen as having been taken over by Dido, that he's staying in Carthage for her, that he no longer seeks to found his city of Trojan refugees in Italy. This is a threat to Jupiter, who knows Aeneas must found his city. Of course, it's all blamed on the woman, even when there are no details of their love affair. Who started it? Who continued it? Whether it continued at all. Dido is overtaken by her love and passion for Aeneas, but all that came from his mother, Venus, not Dido herself. Who's to say whether she would have even liked him, had Venus and Cupid not placed this overwhelming love spell on the Queen of Carthage? She's blamed all the same. It's now Dido who's preventing Aeneas from fulfilling his destiny, and Jupiter's going to do something about it. He sends Mercury down to speak to Aeneas, to relay that this isn't what Aeneas is meant to do, that it isn't what Venus, his mother, promised when he was saved from death so many times. He's meant to found an empire, the greatest empire in Italy. Dido isn't of concern. Jupiter really guilts the fuck out of Aeneas while he's instructing Mercury. Quote, Does he begrudge his son, the Roman citadel? Like, chill the fuck out, Jupiter. The man had some sex and maybe is in love? Hard to say. Dido's is fake. Just calm down, man. It'll all work out. For Aeneas, at least. When Mercury arrives in Carthage to speak with Aeneas, he gets right to the point. I bet your wife is thrilled that you're focusing all your effort on building Carthage, he tells Aeneas in a super passive-aggressive way. She must love that you've forgotten all about the empire you're supposed to be founding in Italy, where you'll become the founder of the greatest empire of all time. Yeah, she must love that you've forgotten all about that. Anyway, Mercury's a fucking dick in the Aeneid. I mean, all the gods are dicks in their own way. Less fun than the dick gods of the Greeks, though. Mercury continues, Jupiter, you know him, the king of the gods. He sent me here specifically to talk to you about your bullshit, Aeneas. 
He says exactly what Jupiter wanted, guilting Aeneas about his remaining in Carthage, specifically in regards to his son and preventing Ascanius from ever ruling a great city founded by his father. I mean, the gods know what buttons to press, that's for sure. With that all said, Mercury disappears, leaving Aeneas to think about what's been said, to think about why he's still there in Carthage. It doesn't take much to convince Aeneas that he needs to leave Carthage, to leave Dido. The gods made their point. They remind him of the fame he's supposed to gain by founding his city in Italy, and that fame is all he needs. It's far more appealing than the love of Dido, the love of this incredible, badass queen of Carthage. Aeneas's mind immediately turns once Mercury has left, and he's left contemplating how he'll tell Dido, what he can say to her, how he can leave Carthage, and quickly. Or, he thinks about it a little more, No, he's got a better plan. He'll simply sneak away entirely. She doesn't even need to know that he's planning to leave. Yeah, that's the best and definitely the least cowardly plan. Aeneas calls together a few of his Trojan soldiers, telling them his plan, asking them to put together ships, to gather all their things, to prepare to leave secretly in the night. Keep it all hidden, he instructs. The queen mustn't know we plan to leave. No Carthaginian must know that we plan to leave. (sighs) Well, I won't lie. I thought we would get to the big moment on this episode, but I should have known that I'm way, way wordier than I ever expect to be. So instead, I'll just say, gee, I wonder what's going to happen in our next Aeneid episode. Ugh. Honestly, I love Dido so much. It's so fucking frustrating how this is handled. It's all for Rome, too. All to prove Rome's impressive history and mythology. Whereas the mythology of Dido itself? Aeneas is not the be-all and end-all of Dido, the founding queen of Carthage. If anyone knows any sources, actually, for information on Dido in Carthage, i.e. after she founded the city, other than Virgil and Ovid, please let me know. I'm so, so curious how she's handled and what kind of role Aeneas plays if you're not reading Roman propaganda. It's just fascinatingly different from the Greek epics, you know? Homer wasn't trying to prove some wider point. The Greeks are fucking awful in the Iliad, and that's just fine. No one's trying to prove themselves to be greatest of the great. It's just a fascinating story of mythology. Anyway, Rome, am I right? You're all the best. Thank you all for listening. Please, you know, tell your friends. Give me a five-star review. The whole shebang. I'm really working to grow this podcast so that I can comfortably have this as my only job and therefore not lose my mind entirely. Because honestly, we're on the line these days with how busy I am. And any new listeners help me get closer to that goal. When this is my job, too, I'll be able to do more Patreon-specific content, so consider becoming a patron. There's a bunch of back content now, but man, when I don't have to spend five of life seven days at my job, oh, the time I will have to create more fun stuff for you all. Thank you all. I am Liv, and oh, how I love this shit. <laughs>